which is the angel symbol of the feminine. Okay, and then we see the figure sitting here next to him. Look at the delicate hands clasped. Look at the sweet cherubic face. I, I believe that he was trying to tell us that this is a woman. This was Mary Magdalene, who then took over the church after the crucifixion. In fact, it was Mary Magdalene and James, his brother, who then became the leaders of the church in Jerusalem after the crucifixion. And they pointed to Paul and said he was an apostate, and they ran him out. And that's why he had to go and travel around through Asia Minor and end up in Rome, where he found some fellowship. These Roman guys that were starting the Roman church, they liked him because he didn't like women. He didn't want them in the church. And he had a very structured and strict view of Christianity. And so they said, well, Paul, you're our man. And that's where pretty much we get our version of modern Christianity. But just to show you that Leonardo da Vinci was not just playing around, uh, we also find in this 13th century German uh, fresco of, a, of The Last Supper and in Jean Foucault's painting, and also in Albert Durer, Jesus is pictured with a woman. Okay, so this is where the church has kind of confused everything. And Rensselaer Chateau sits on a series of, of uh, religious sites that when connected form a giant pentagram, and when I was over there I was told that this represents an ancient uh, Gothic cathedral to Isis. So the Isis and the whole living, uh, uh, the story of resurrection, the whole thing, this all again goes back to ancient stories that have been passed along. Uh, even uh, Nicholas Poussin, the painter, tried to give us a little bit of a hint by showing this, uh, the, the plague of uh, Rome uh, includes the Ark of the Covenant. And the Masons, of course, venerate the Ark. Here's a temper meeting, painting of a temper meeting from 1147, and we see the Ark. And today in the George Washington Masonic National Memorial, the Royal Ark Room, they've got a replica, I guess a replica, of the Ark of the Covenant. So what was the big deal about the Ark of the Covenant? Well, we know from the Bible it was given us a very detailed description. And from the description and the fact that the mercy seat or the lid was covered in solid gold, that means just the lid alone would have weighed 2,714 pounds. And yet we've got pictures of guys, you know, four guys, carrying it around, that four guys can carry around, uh, you know, a ton. Uh, but now, when we understand that it was contained, the white powder, and that the white powder has anti-gravatic properties, and we know that in the late 80s they used a ceramic superconductor uh, with liquid nitrogen and produced a floating anti-gravity demonstration that that actually works. So now we've got the possibility the Ark of Covenant was not being carried, it was being guided because it was just kind of floating along. And being a superconductor, that's why they were able to use it for communication. God's voice came out of the sea. And uh, so now we're finding out this again points to the ancient technology that we are only just now becoming aware of thanks to the church. Um, of course the Knights Templars were put down. They, a lot of them fled to Scotland. This is where you get the Scottish Rite. And the Sinclairs also went there, built Roslyn Castle. We've got George Washington. And 
prominent uh, Freemason, and you have to understand that Freemasonry is not all sinister conspirators. The vast bulk of Freemasons are good, honest people. They got the burn centers. They do good work. They're in it for the social, business contacts, but they have an inner circle that these guys know some of the ancient secrets and what some of the hidden agendas is. Now, if you ask a Freemason if that's the case, they're all going to say no. Because, number one, they're either a member of the outer circle and they truly don't know that the inner circle exists, or they're a member of the inner circle, in which case they've taken a blood oath never to reveal that. And this isn't my supposition. I'm going basing this on the writings of Albert Pike and Mackey and other prominent uh, Masons who have revealed all of this. Now, we also know that the knowledge was passed on up into the southern Russia area. Uh, and back in the 10th century, there was the Khazarian Empire. This is very important for y'all to understand. The Khazarian Empire lay between the um, Black Sea and uh, the other one. <laughs> Caspian? The Caspian, thank you. And it was comprised of about a third Muslims, a third Christians, and a third uh, Jewish. All right. Now it started off. The Khazars were M Mongolian heritage, and they started off as caravan raiders. Uh, but then and they grew rich and prosperous, raiding the caravans. And then by the 10th century, they had a big empire there, and they had an aristocracy. And their aristocracy got some learning, and they decided, you know, surely there's a better way to make money besides risking our lives raiding caravans. That could be hazardous. So they, I think they decided that, you know, we're here in the middle of the caravan routes between the east and west. We can make a lot of money off of money, okay? We can borrow money, exchange money, loan money, you know, but they had a problem. Because at this time, the Muslims and the Christians said, Charging interest on a loan is usury, and it's not only wrong, it's a sin. Only the Jews said you can loan money and interest, particularly to the Goyim, the non-Jews. So at this point, the aristocrats of the Khazars said, Oh, we're Jews. And they embraced <laughs> Judaism. They have to understand, there's Judaism is a religion. Hebrewism is a race, and Zionism is a political movement. Sammy Davis Jr. was a Jew, but he wasn't a Hebrew, was he? All right, and there are plenty of international banking. <laughs> exactly, and that's what I'm getting to. These Khazars, after the Russians came in and broke up the empire, and and later the whole place became named after them, Russia. Uh, a lot of these Khazars fled and they went into Eastern Europe and they are the progenitors of the Rothschilds. So the Rothschilds are Khazarian Jews. I'm, I'm not going to address their religious beliefs. They may be sincere, they may not. The point is they're not Hebrews. And this is important because they have been the major uh, originators of Zionism. And Zionism is the movement that says, you know, we're going to take part of Palestine in the Middle East, and that's the homeland for the Jews because God promised us a homeland, and that belongs to us. Well, this has been propagated by the Rothschilds, and they are not even Hebrews. They have no connection to Palestine. And, but they did work in close proximity with Hitler's Third Reich, to get rid of Orthodox Jews. Why? Because Orthodox Jews, very religious Jews, are the most dedicated opponents of Zionism. So in World War II, they wiped out the, the uh, religious leaders of the Jews and then laid this thing on us about, uh, you know, they, they got the Holocaust and World War II, so they deserve a homeland, so they take it away from the Palestinians. And the whole idea when they created Palestine, and as you all may know, this comes back to the uh, Balfour Declaration. 
Uh, Alfred Balfour was the, uh, was the uh, Prime Minister of England and the Balfour Declaration, which simply said England did not have any problem with uh, the Jews creating a homeland in Palestine, and this was done right after World War I, when the British had taken control over the area. That was in response to a letter from Lord Rothschild. So the Rothschilds are the uh, fathers of modern Israel, and they, are, they may be professing Jews, but they are not Hebrews. And the whole original idea was is that they were to partition off Palestine and one section was to go to the Jews, one section was to go to the Palestinians. Since then, they have now pressed to the point to where there's only the Gaza Strip and one or two of the little small sections where the Palestinians are still holding on. But this is a lecture for another day. The Rothschilds, of course, sent his sons and they began to run banking in Austria, Italy, France, England, um, and they began to play one country off against each other. And the reason old man Meyer Rothschild got his start was thanks to the American Revolution, because he was the uh, accountant, we'll say, for the Duke of Hesse in Germany, and it was Rothschild who arranged for the Hessians to come fight the colonists. And the reason the British hired the Hessians to come fight the colonists because they had figured out that they weren't getting a lot of zealous fighting out of their own British people who were over here fighting their fellow British citizens in the United States. So they hired the Hessians to come and fight because, you know, And this is important for us to understand because right now, today, our military is all off somewhere. 71 other countries, primarily Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Libya. They're not even here. But who's here? The remnants of the East German military, Russian Spaznitz troops. There are lots, thousands of foreign troops in this country right now, today, training. Okay, now, if something untoward happens, and we have to have a United Nations peacekeeping force. Who are they going to use? Our guys? No, because our soldiers are not going to come kick in your door and take your guns, but these guys will because they have no connection. Same deal. All right. And then, of course, then Freemasonry got infiltrated by the Illuminati. And then with Rothschild running the Bank of England, they, this is what actually precipitated the American Revolution. Benjamin Franklin said that colleagues would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment dissatisfaction. What's he talking about? It's all about money today. See. Up until about the 17th century, the age of enlightenment, the, when the printing press came along and everybody could get their hands on a Bible, and by the way, for about 100 years there, it was against the law to own, print, or possess a Bible, all right? Because the church didn't want anybody reading it for themselves. They wanted the priesthood to tell you what it said, all right? Today, of course, you go in any rent a motel room, there's a Gideon Bible in the, in the desk, so we don't think about this, but this is the changes that have taken place. So up until the age of enlightenment, the control mechanism over humanity was religion. God put me in this position and told me to tell you, here's what you've got to do. Well, with the Bible and with education and more people learning to read and the Bible went around and people went, well, wait a minute, that's not exactly what the Vatican's been telling us, you know, well then religion began to, to decrease in its power with population, so what took its place? Money. Today, whoever owns the money controls everything, all right? And this is what Benjamin Franklin was talking about. The 13 colonies had colonial script, which was currency based on the goods and services available in that colony, and they were all prospering. Nobody was borrowing money, all right? So the Rothschilds didn't like this, and their banker friends, the Schiffs and the others, they said, whoa, we're not getting our cut out of this. 
So they strong armed the King of England, uh, King George at that time, who couldn't even speak English because he was a crap. Uh, pardon me, you know, German. <laughs> In fact, the Windsors, you know, had changed their name from the uh, Mountbatten's, which was a uh, anglicization of, of uh, Battenberg, and they're all they're all Germans, and that's why in World War II. The Queen Mother said, and this surfaced a few years ago, you'll find in my book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, she, she was perfectly okay with the Nazis invading and taking over England, as long as they maintained loyalty. Right. <laughs> so, they, King George outlawed colonial script and made them take Bank of England notes, which just like our Federal Reserve notes, are debt-based money, based on really nothing but just fiat money. They just force you to take it. That's what he's talking about. And we're under the same situation today. Okay? There's only been two American presidents who've tried to issue debt-free money. One was Abraham Lincoln when he issued greenbacks to finance the war between the states. And the other, believe it or not, was John F. Kennedy, who in June of 1963 issued $4.2 billion in United States notes issued through the Treasury, not through the Federal Reserve System, which we have to pay interest to. And folks, I don't think it was just a coincidence that both those presidents were shot in the head in public. <laughs>
let's skip on through here. You know about the Federal Reserve System. You know that uh, Paul Warburg, you know, helped create it. He was a banker from Germany, and here he is circled. The first uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Well, at the same time, his brother Max is running the show over in Germany. In fact, it was Max who was one of those that let Lenin pass through Germany in the sealed railroad car and go into Russia and start the Communist Revolution. And Max also was a co-founder of the IG Furman Combine, which was the giant chemical thing, which is now the grandfather of every giant chemical corporation, pharmaceutical corporation today, owes its heritage to IG Furman, which at one time was packaging and selling uh, heroin under the brand name heroin. <laughs> <laughs> And Max also not only was with IG Farming, but sat on the board of Hamburg America Steamship Line, which was the conduit prior to and during World War II for Nazi saboteurs, propaganda, and money in the United States. And he sat on the same board with Prescott Bush, okay, wow. who in late 1942 was prosecuted under the Trading with the Enemies Act for being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. All right? And the only reason he didn't get thrown in jail and he didn't make a big deal about it was because in the summer of 1942, when he undoubtedly knew they were looking into his business activities, what did he do? He helped found the United Service Organization, the USO. Now, you older folks, particularly any of you all been in the military, you love the USO. That's a little piece of home if you're in the military. All right, when I was in the Army, man, we loved the USO. So in the middle of World War II, it would have been a propaganda disaster to tell everybody that the guy that founded the USO was actually a Nazi financial front man. So they slapped him on the wrist and covered the whole thing up. That's why the Bushes had to flee Connecticut. And they came to Texas where they bought their way in because the people in Connecticut knew about their Nazi background. We did. <laughs> Texas is always five years or more behind <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> all right, so all these people have talked for years telling us that there's stuff going on, okay? So it's not just me, it's just there. But you're not hearing about this because the media is bought and controlled for it. So the same people ran both sides of World War I. The same people that backed the communists then backed Hitler to try to stop them. It's incredible. The, and the, uh, back in 1911, they knew that Karl Marx was a friend and was being put in position by Wall Street. But we don't know that today, do we? Now, they created, then once the communists took over in Russia, they were, how do you, what better way to control a movement than to start it and fund it? But the problem was Lenin died, Stalin took over, he was an iron-fisted dictator. They didn't have complete control over him. They created the International. The, communist, the communism was going worldwide. There were strong communist parties in England, France, Germany, even the United States, international workers of the world, the Wobblies, you know, go back and study your history. It's incredible, you know, what's going on here. Now they got afraid. Well, they can't have communism going worldwide because then they can't play off one country against another. So they reached into Germany and found a German army intelligence agent who was working, trying to make a living as a 
unsuccessfully as a painter, but he's making money on the side by being a snitch for the army, as so many of his World War I buddies had been doing. And he reports back and said, you're going to like the German Workers' Party because they think we were stabbed in the back and they want to rebuild the German military. So the German military, the uh, occult Fuhlsgesellschaft, the Fuhl Society, and the industrialists in Germany, and the international bankers, including Wall Street and the Bank of England, backed this guy, and of course that was Adolf Hitler. Well, he takes power. When he took power in Germany, Germany was on its knees financially. Half the country was out of work. The, the, the Deutsche Mark was almost worthless. Remember the stories how they take a wheelbarrow load of money just to get a loaf of bread? And in two years, Hitler turned it all around. By 1936, three years later, they had the Berlin Olympics, and Germany was the economic showpiece of the world. Everybody was back to work. Why? You know, how'd that happen? Because Hitler did not borrow money from the international bankers. He created his own money, just like Abraham Lincoln had done, and then started work projects, including building up his war machine, but also the Autobahn, public buildings, put everybody back to work, everybody's getting a paycheck, money's flowing through the economy. They're doing great because they don't owe anybody, okay? <gasps> Oops, wait a minute. We can't have that. We just saw that Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy tried that, and they both got shot in the head. Well, what about Hitler? Did they try to kill him? Only about 25 times, okay? <laughs> there were 25 assassination attempts on Hitler, all right? But unlike Kennedy and unlike uh, Lincoln, Hitler surrounded himself with loyalists, and they protected him, so he survived. So they had to start World War II to get rid of him. And here's just a few of the companies, corporations behind Hitler, and you can see that it's all the major corporate stuff. In fact, fascism is a term that is generally attributed to Benito Mussolini after his black-shirted fascistas. But Mussolini himself, and you can read this in my book, Rise of the Fourth Reich, said that fascism really isn't the proper term. The more proper term is corporatism, ruled by the corporations. In fact, the dictionary definition of fascism is the blending of state and corporate power. Oops, that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? The only difference between us today in America and Nazi Germany is that in Nazi Germany, the state gained control over the corporations and it was that blending of state and corporate power that was the definition of fascism. Today in modern America, the corporations have gained control over the state. End result's the same. And even Winston Churchill said, you must understand that this war is not against Hitler or National Socialism, but against the strength of the German people, meaning the economic might of the German people, which must be smashed once and for all, regardless of whether it's in the hands of Hitler or a Jesuit priest. So they did not want the, the masters, the finance, finance rulers of Wall Street and the Bank of England did not want Germany leading the world financial order. So that's when we fought World War II. You're reading all of this in World by Secrecy. Now we also know that uh, Nazis were after a cult thing. They were very much into alternative stuff. We saw that. So this brings us to Otto Rahn. I'm going to skip through this real quick because we got a lot to cover. Otto Rahn got interested in the Cathars, wrote a book. Heinrich Himmler made him member of the SS. But then by uh, 1939, he had decided the Nazis were bad, and he resigned from the SS. And the next month, he, he was, uh, they reported he had been died in a hiking accident. Uh, most people think he died in a concentration camp.
Well, what was he all about? Because he had studied the Cathars and he got a line on Solomon's treasure. He thought he knew probably where it was there in the cavern system of the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains in the Languedoc region of southern France. Now, they couldn't go there right away because those of you who actually know your history know that all of France was not occupied by the Nazis during World War II, only the northern part. Southern part was Vichy France, supposedly an autonomous country, but just a puppet of the Germans, but still uh, it would not look nice if they moved their troops in there, so they were kind of prohibited from moving. But then in 1943, after we began to invade uh, Italy, uh, Hitler declared that he had to protect the soft underbelly of Europe, so he just marched his troops on into the rest of France. So by the end of 1943, the, all of France was under German occupation. And uh, in March of 1944, here comes Otto Scorzini, his top commando, all right, who had rescued Mussolini off the mountaintop, brought him back and kept Italy in the war, although we were fighting the Germans then instead of the Italians. And, and in March 1944, Scorzini and SS troops move into the Languedoc region, and on March the 16th, 44, he sends a one-word telegram back to Berlin, Eureka. The Nazis got Solomon's treasure, all right? Not only the gold and silver, but also the secrets. So they took it back, they put it in the subterranean caverns there at uh, Birch's Garden and Merck's and other places, melted the gold down. And you can read about this in my work of faction, which is fact-based fiction, uh, The Sisterhood of the Rose. Any of y'all like a good rousing yarn? This is about a sisterhood of women uh, who recruit Ava Brown and Clara Patacci, who was mistress to uh, Benito Mussolini, and they actually get these involved, and they're all working to try to bring around world peace and get rid of Nazi tyranny. Here's just a little bit of the gold that we recovered at Merckx, Germany, at the end of the war. Now, if this is what we recovered, think how much got away. Also, advanced technology. They had flying saucers on the drawing board. The only question is, did they have some that worked? And the information today is, yes, they did. You can read about this in Alien Agenda. Here's one of the diagrams of the Shriver sausage. saucer. Here was a very interesting works. It's still in ruins over in Poland. Where they had their super secret work. Uh, they had uh, this thing called a fly trap. Uh, some people theorize this may have been an early day super collider superconductor. Uh, they were building what was known as the Glocka, or the Bell. And this is a drawing of it right here, and then this is one that they've actually built and is working today over in Poland. These are concentric rings, magnetic rings, uh, under high energy creating high torsion energy fields. Of, uh, of, circular, of circular energy, okay, creating energy fields. This is goes back to the ancient technology, the manipulation of energy at the atomic and subatomic level. And the Nazis were working on this under the command of General Hans Kommler. who disappeared at the end of the war, and we don't know what happened to him, although he's reported seen in the United States. Now, 
did uh, where did the Nazis get their exotic technology? Well, for years people said, well, they found a crash saucer like at Roswell and they back-engineered it. 